So let's take it from the top. One ringy dingy, two ringy dingies. Hello, your eminence. Hello, your eminence. Are we late or am I uh, earlier? What's going on here? Well, it's 11.08 here, but I think a second was uh, taken off by Circo of your time. So your life has been either foreshortened or forelengthened. It's going to be forelengthened. Uh, do you know what the biggest drawback in Africa is? Uh, the stupidity of the Brits? No, they foreskin on an elephant. But anyway, back to uh, back to demonstrating that not all Brits are are without education. I I understand that you probably know. In fact, I've got to think of a I've got a code name I was supposed to ask you about. Let me see if I have it here. There's a fellow that you know as Dirty Driveway that gave me uh, a code name I was supposed to add. I can't remember what it was. It might have been Hanrick. But anyway, um, I think we, we hear the long series of rings, yes. Uh, Livery said fields disappeared. No, I haven't. But David, uh, while I greet the chat room, uh, why don't you tell us something really interesting, including how wonderful you think today's radio show ad is? Yeah, I looked at it. It's uh, very intriguing, the incredible span of subjects. Um, one I picked out, was this picture of uh, JFK coming out of, I think it's the Texas Hotel in Fort Worth. Um, that's uh, as he was about to, I believe, fly to Dallas and get whacked. Um, and it turns out that something I didn't know, well, I think I knew, but I'd forgotten. In 1962, when the Telstar satellite was launched, it established nearly perfect synchronization between Greenwich Mean Time and the United States of America, somewhere to within, I believe, 200 uh, micro or nanoseconds. Very accurate. But I also discovered that the synchronization activity was taking place in BBC a house in directly opposite the Langham Hotel. Now, what they told us, Field, was that in 1962 that Telstar satellite failed because it went through the Van Allen radiation belt after an atomic bomb explosion. But I put it to you, it would be very interesting if, whether the whole thing had failed or not, if the synchronization timing signal from the atomic clock invented and operated out of the National Physical Laboratory was still intact so that uh, when they were setting up the hit of uh, JFK, they were able to synchronize the sniper teams in Dallas with the people tracking JFK and Jackie through the Texas Hotel, which I think now is a Hilton Hotel, with the BBC uh, who will be putting on the snuff film. Do you think that's plausible? That's a run-on question. Over to you. The BBC's putting on snuff films? Did you ask me that question? Yes. Do you know that Pinewood Studios just uh, announced record earnings? I bet. Well, that that's not a... I said, are you aware? So it's a yes or a no. No. Oh, well... Yeah, they are. Um, plane was at Love Field in Dallas. Okay, and Swamp says that, and Swamp can tell you about Pinewood Studios and record profits uh, because it's in the news today. But something that I found in the news today is uh, threats of a false flag in Houston, threats of a false flag on 7-7. Are you aware, David, this is a yes or no question, uh, are you aware that there's been four bomb threats in the last five days in Canada? Uh, no. Okay, it, it, that's true. And I don't know if Sherlock's here today. I got that from Sherlock about two hours ago. Uh, no, Sherlock's not here, but Sunshine is and Swamp is. So we got we got we got a whole lot of people that start with S. Uh, Afterburners here. Uh, let's see, Afterburner. Then we uh, got to check to see if. After Burner, Liverish, and Denise are three UK people, and I got to answer them via email. And then Doug, who's not here, I don't think, and VP. Nope, VP's not here. 
Anyway, um, there's something going on over in England on the 31st and also the 29th of July. And uh, I have a wedding in a couple of weeks that I've got to go um, attend. It's one of my daughters. I always thought nobody would ever be good enough for a daughter of mine. I think that's the way a lot of fathers feel, but I don't feel that way anymore because two out of four um, have good guys. Really, I have to remove the Confederate flag? That's great, George. I wish I would have put that in the uh, the show today. But anyway, uh, Liverish P and Denise and Afterburner are here, and there's something cooking uh, regarding the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta. And the question in my mind um, is, is the Magna Carta real? Is it in effect? Was it ever put into effect, or was it curtailed by the Vatican? And those are questions I don't know and I may never know. But I do know that the fifth... Um, threat against a Canadian airliner uh, probably is not well known north of the 49th parallel right now. I'll leave it at that and I'll turn it over to you David so you can do that really smart stuff while I look for images in the chat room. Uh, yeah, well interesting you should say about uh, Pinewood Studios with record profits because just uh, kitty corner from Pinewood is uh, the Shepparton Studios that was started by William Stevenson, who invented, or I believe he stole a patent related to an invention relating to apparatus for transmitting pictures to a distance electronically and to apparatus for dealing with the problem known as television. And the two patent uh, patentees applying for the patent, presumably in the UK, was William Samuel Stevenson and George William Walton. Now, I think I taught you about money shots, didn't I, Phil? Yes, the money shot, we discussed that on the uh, 7th of August of 2008, when we were discussing arbitrage, leverage, denouement, uh, secondment, and uh, Hillary's file taint, as I recall, recalling that taint stands for tactical analysis involving naval treason. Over to you, David. Yeah, so a money shot is the particular frame of a film which records the victim being hit with a weapon, a grenade, a bullet, or a form standing or sitting in a passenger plane flying into the side of a mountain at, let's say, 430 miles an hour. So if the camera is pointing at the face of said victim, frame A will show the victim's face distorted by fear and frame B will go blank. And if there's a timestamp on frame A to within a few milliseconds, microseconds or nanoseconds, it could prevent any argument amongst the spot fixing betters as to who was closest in predicting the time of death of said victim. Now, it seems to me that the American media has glossed over the fact that there was a serial assassination in Tunis, uh, which I think is quite remarkable, because I believe up to 30 Brits were called. Now, the individual who's alleged to have shot these Brits arrived by either, and it seems to be a, an odd thing to have some doubts about, either a jet ski or a Zodiac on the beach near a town called Sos. Does that remind you of any other earlier serial assassinations, Field? Over to you. Yeah, it does. You said a jet ski or a Zodiac, which is an inflatable boat used by the SEALs. Um, it does vaguely rekindle something in my vast expanse of empty cranial cavity, but I can't really put my finger on it other than in our fiction, uh, numerous times Agent Chips would uh, do a assault on a beach, uh, generally including, well, somebody with a Confederate bathing suit might be in the Zodiac. And I'm trying to think, I think it was in 2009 that's a long time ago. David, we've been doing this crap way too long. That's six years ago. And I can remember it like it was yesterday. In fact, I'm going to try to put a Google pairing 
Uh, I think it would be Destin, Florida, plus Presidential Limo, plus Ramey High School, plus Agent Chips, plus Agent Bean. I'll put that into the chat room, and I bet something will come up from 2009, just to demonstrate that we've sure been around a long time doing this stuff, David, and at some point, isn't their dam going to burst and we're going to win as they get flooded with the truth? Yeah, totally. I think that the Zodiac attack that uh, this reminds me of, well, I think there were two. There was the USS Cold in Aden Harbor. Ah, yes. That's one. And then there's the Mumbai Massacre on America's Thanksgiving Day. Yes, and that was in 2008, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm, no, I, I get fuzzy with all these, uh, you know, lone gunmen or um, organized precise assassinations as to which particular year it was, because the year is less relevant than the time, you see, Phil, mm -hmm. because the time, if I'm right, that these are subjects of online assassination betting using the onion router, the time is important because there is a series of people off book who are placing money in a pool against a targeted name or a guest in a hotel, let's say, and they have to predict the time of death. So one person might say, I don't know, in 911, in the case of Gerald DeConto, who I remind people was the duty officer of the Pentagon's U.S. Navy Command Center in a room that was being upgraded by the British company AMEC, the people who were betting, and this is a seriously high value target, of course, because he represents the link between the President of the United States and the US Navy around the world. <clears throat> and if perchance that link was broken, it would allow the Chinese Navy to attack Taiwan, because they'd be fairly certain that the battle fleet of American Navy patrolling the Formosa Straits would have been decapitated. So when Captain Gerald de Conto died, my guess is there was a snuff film taken where the camera had been set up by AMEC inside the Pentagon's US Navy Command Center. So the folks who intended harm to Captain Gerald de Conto and to the United States Republic would be able to watch and bet on precisely when he died because of the timestamps coming on the frames of the images backhaul to, well, where would the logical place to backhaul these images be? I presume it would be the BBC or the hotel directly opposite, which has participated in these kinds of assassinations, named the Langham Hotel. So when the bettors are placing their bets, they could say, all right, Captain Gerald de Conto will die at, depending on where the war room was established, and let's assume it was established in Dubai, we can come to that in a minute, in the Sheraton Hotel in Dubai, which uh, has been equipped with circo communications equipment for about the last 50 years, but let's just assume that there's a virtual war room in the Sheraton Hotel in Dubai, and the time step there is eight hours after time in Washington, which I guess is, is that Eastern Standard Time or Eastern District Time? I don't know. Is that a question? Uh, yeah. Okay. What, what month was it? This was September 2001. Okay, September 11th? Yep. Okay, then that would still be in uh, Eastern Daylight Time, I believe, because they switch over. It's uh, spring forward and fall back, and fall back usually occurs in late October, but not always. Somebody out there in the chat room, uh, somebody named Jake R. thinks I have a good memory, uh, I, I can't take credit for that. I don't have a good memory. It's just David and I have been doing this every day since um, the 6th of December of 2006. And so when you're constantly dealing with the same stuff, 
It's very easy to remember it, such as the... In fact, watch this. While I butcher these lyrics, Swamp Rat's going to find a YouTube link to Younger Generation by the Love and Spoonful, wherein, uh, hey, Dad, my girlfriend's only three. She's got her own video phone, and she's a taken LSD. And now that we're best friends, she wants to give her bit to me. What you saying, Father? Um, could it seem you can't live up to your dreams? Anyway, it's a wonderful song about younger generation. There, somebody put it up. In fact, Swamp Rat put it up. I wonder if she put that up before or after. And then Jake has uh, gone. See, Jake thinks I have a good memory. Uh, no, I don't, Jake. But I can think. You know, when he said, when David said Zodiac Boat, uh, yes, I was aware of the um, bird. Do you remember that, David? Yes or no, when we predicted the Thoriah phones and the boat assault on the beach? At, uh, somebody's going to think I have a good memory. The um, Oberi, O-B-E-R-O-M-B-I, which is Bombay. <clears throat> and it's because I used to stay in that hotel. So uh, rather than think I have a good memory, wouldn't it make more sense to realize God's doing all this and I'm just playing my part just like a little puppet? Pull my string and I'll come to you. I'm your puppet. I'll do funny things if you ask me to. I'm your puppet. That's by James and Bobby Purify. Hmm. What does purify mean? Well, I'd explain it, but a lot of you wouldn't believe me, but it has to do with silver and gold. But it more, ex why don't you... Um, figure out what we should say that's very intellig intelligent, so I have something to uh, for you to be doing to keep you occupied while I look at this Confederate flag bathing suit one last time uh, before going to check what Jake R. has provided me in terms of a search. And the search terms off the top of my head were 1995 presidential limousine, Destin, Florida, Agent Chips, and Agent Bean. And it was, in fact, in October or September. I can't remember anymore. Um, I think it was October, October of 2009. That's where our fiction claims I got to know her. I'd like to get to know you if I could. I'd like to get to know you if I could. That's Spanky in our gang. Spanky's real name was Spanky McFarland. She was a great singer, rivaled uh, Mama Cass in strength of voice. Okay, so David, while I hark back to pastel pursuits uh, and I look for the Google search that Jake has provided, uh, Doreen in Massachusetts, who's a grandmother at the tender age of 46, has told me she thinks that you and I are very patient because we don't pull our hair out that we've been doing this for December. On the 6th of December, it'll be nine years since you and I had our first conversation, and just to show Jake R that I remember details that are none of my business, uh, do you remember the two, the three questions you asked me on that initial contact, David? Uh, are you a pilot? Well, there were actually two of those questions. See if you can come okay, up with are you a Go ahead. Are you a fighter pilot? That's one of them. Are you a big jet pilot? One was, are you a military? What was that? Are you drunk? No, you said, are you a drunk? Oh, yes. Uh, David. Are you a drunk? What if I'd said yes? Well, I think I would have carried on because uh, drunks can be useful too. Well, of course they are. I mean, every, every old Western has a town drunk in it. Uh, but anyway, this is not the old Westerns. This is the new global purification process, and um, I've been invited by Liverish peasant, <clears throat> whose Joyce, <laughs> whose Joyce, whose name is really of the six people that got together for a lunch in Vanishing Points relatives apartment or flat in London, and we had a wonderful lunch. And Doug McNichol, who I think is in Cyprus today, uh, Doug McNichol brought in some 
London Pride or some London Pale Ale or something. But he had some lovely beer. And not, you know, I didn't want Doug to turn into a drunk, so I drank most of his beer. So, David, you called me and you said, uh, we were put in touch by Dan Hanley. You called me and you said, Field, I've been told that you might be able to help me. Are you a military pilot? I said, yes. And you said, are you an airline pilot? And I said, yes. And you said, oh, this is better than Christmas. He says, you're not a drunk, are you? And those are the three questions you asked me. And I think it's, I think it's hilarious. But it just shows that, you know, nobody in England understands this. I'm rather arrogant. And I don't know, I mean, that's not, you're not arrogant. But I mean, that type of a comment almost sounds arrogant. But anyway, I said, yes, yes, and no. And the next go down below where I said it would. I think I said it would be down below 121 by September. Uh, but it skirted at 118 this morning before rebounding up to 127 or something. Swamp Ride will put that in. I'm going to turn it over to you, David. Oh, George H's Precious Fluids. Okay. Just to dazzle George H, who's 65, and Jake R, who's a generation younger, um, there is a movie called Dr. Strangelove where Peter Sellers was to play four parts but he ended up only paying play the part of the B-52 pilot, which was played by uh, Slim Pickens. Um, but in that movie, the deranged Air Force general who orders a nuclear strike on Russia talks to a British guy about heavenly bodily fluids. And he's talking about the same type of heavenly bodily fluids that are DNA rich, according to Agent Chips, who no longer writes fiction. David, over to you. Right, Field. So EDT Eastern Daylight Time was to have been around 9.37.19 when Captain Gerald de Conto was going to be whacked in the money shop that was backhauled, presumably, to the BBC and then distributed over on the precise time of death. So you might, of course, if you go uh, in Dubai, which is eight hours long, instead of 9.37.19, 19, because that's the button you push to predict the time of death of Captain Gerald de Conto, where the intent was, of course, being the duty officer of the US Navy Command Center, to because Captain Gerald de Conto was, at that moment when he died, commissioning the upgrade known as the Penren Project, that is Pentagon Renovation Project, managed by the British company Serco. Now, if Americans ask themselves, well, why would the United States Department of Defense subcontract an upgrade to what supposedly the best defended building in the United States, if not of the world, to a British company that has a basically a criminal record. Well, I think you'll have to ask uh, the people who subcontracted that contract. But no, correction. More particularly, who set aside a whole chunk of business under that contract. I think the master contract or prime contractor was Lockheed Martin uh, subcontracting to uh, AMEC and the 8A companies associated with the Small Business Administration Chief Operating Officer, who just happens to be Field Sister. Anyway, let's not go there. The interesting thing is if I'm a better a sheikh that likes little boys and camel races in Dubai, and I want to bet on the time of death of Captain Gerald de Conto so that my associates who also like little boys in China could uh, mobilize the Chinese Navy to attack Taiwan because the US Navy had been stood down, I might have selected the time of death for Captain Gerald de Conto as not 9-17-37, but 17-37-17 because I'm in a hotel in Dubai and I scoop the pot if Captain Gerald de Conto dies at 
19. So it's quite remarkable, really, because what must have happened is the security in place around the Pentagon during the exercise, the continuity of government exercise, must have been such that someone, and I think it was Field's sister, was able to stand down the Pentagon defences by instructing her 8A companies to interfere with the communications needed by the Department of Defense and the Pentagon to respond correctly to this hypothesized or hypothecated hijacking of 911. Now, do we have any evidence that the command and control system of the United States Department of Defense and President was disrupted or jammed? Well, yeah. Apparently, Washington, and just think about this, folks, went blind, deaf, and dumb on 911. Now, the adversary of the United States at that time was a yak straddling, bearded wonder, apparently in a cave in Afghanistan. So, how would a yak straddling, bearded wonder? in a cave in Afghanistan succeed in standing down the most powerful military force in the world on the morning of 911. Well, of course, he didn't. That could only be done by attacking through what is known as a man-in-the-middle approach. Someone inside the National Command Authority's defense red switch network had to issue the stand-down order. So who was inside the, the defense red switch network on 911? Well, the woman who was the chief operating officer of the Small Business Administration 8A company, back to field system. So our original conversation about are you a military pilot and are you an airline pilot and are you drunk led amazingly, I think, and the odds against it must be billions to one, to your sister, Phil, and her role, her primary role in the attack of 911, which was intended to overthrow the United States government. And by the grace of God, and I'm quite willing to say that, you were her sister, or are her sister. And we had a great jumping off point from that conversation while you were having, I think, fish and chips to reach where we are today. And I, I totally agree with you. We don't need memory anymore because we can relive through the eyes of these accused parties what they had to have been doing in order to produce the effects we see at the crime scene. Okay, let me First interrupt. Part, yeah. Because when you said there's several places where the flow of intelligence was interrupted uh, on the morning of 9-11, I held up two fingers. And if you take a look, uh, there's a cartoon of people bailing water out of a boat. Above that, I put up the first uh, Google search, which will lead you to how the uh, delays were imputed. Um, one of them, you can find it by Googling Venus 77 plus Quit 25 plus Nodak 02. And um, wherever that leads will invariably tell you about the three F-16s that took off at 932 from Langley on a scramble. And uh, they were immediately taken over by my sister's senior executive service which is the shadow government, and they were turned off their direct course. Their direct course, uh, the scramble order probably included North, Buster, Washington, D.C., which means vector north from Langley, go at maximum airspeed, that's what Buster is, um, and that would be uh, pretty fast. And... Uh, the target area was Washington, D.C. At this point, the flying vehicle that was mimicking <clears throat> American Flight 77 was bearing down uh, from the northwest, roughly following the course of the Potomac, but roughly being the key word, uh, and had the senior executive service, which my sister started in 1979, had they not interrupted quit 2-5 quit 26 and quit 27 it is the opinion of nodak 02 that they would have id'd um, the flying object 
And because I know that sometimes people with lump jaws and short man complex get owly if you mention their names, Notice for the record, I'm not mentioning anything about John McCain or Sky Warriors, even though Daryl Scourge, the CIA guy in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, may well have modified two Sky Warriors. If I had to gamble or make up some fiction, I'd say the, uh, watch this, J. Carr, get ready to Google, because if Swamp Rat's back from making egg salad, she's going to get this faster than you get it. Uh, the Google that will uh, document what I was just saying is uh, go to faa.gov. <clears throat> That's the faa.gov. There's a hothead. Uh, if you, anybody goes to faa.gov, and if you're a female, uh, where th there's a search bar that starts with an N hyphen. That stands for North American Aircraft Registration. Uh, it, Put this number in, November 876 Romeo Sierra. That's if you're a female. If you happen to be a male, put in November 878 Romeo Sierra. Uh, and those are two of the 25 or so retired Sky Warriors, A3 Sky Warrior, that were in the service of Raytheon Corporation on the morning of 9-11. Two of them had been super modified by Daryl Scourge uh, at the Fort Collins Loveland Airport, which no longer exists. Isn't that funny how they try to destroy things? Um, for instance, Sandy Hook, they had to destroy a school because maybe they'd find proof that nothing ever happened there. Nothing other than paying off a lot of home mortgages and making a lot of actors millionaires. Um, I guess there was a $1 trillion lawsuit filed in December of 2014, which was dismissed. Gee, I can, I can relate to that. A civil case 1 colon 08 hyphen 1600 parentheses RMC uh, was dismissed on the 19th of January of 2011 by Judge Rosemary M. Collier. Uh, someday she may get another chance to review that file. Because had Judge Rosemary M. Collier not been lied to by Suzanne Lynn Kalfas, uh, Robert, no, Rob Plunkett, James Johnson, and Peter John Hoonan, J-A-N-H-U-N-E-N, from the Airline Pilots Association, uh, had they not lied to Judge Rosemary M. Collier, causing her to dismiss the civil case. Once again, if you're slow with a pencil, civil case 1 colon 08 hyphen 1600 parentheses RMC, uh, because had the judge acted upon the truthful information that I provided to the judge, to the FAA, to the NTSB, to the FBI, and to the world, uh, the baker's dozen of airline false flags beginning, some people would think I'm going to say 9-11. Nope. That, that's a different thing. The baker's dozen begin with Adam Air 507, which went down on the 1st of January of 2007, and ends when MSM 1114 goes down. Gee, it could go down on July 13th in Canada. Could be an Airbus. We'll have to wait until July 13th. But um, we don't have to wait till July 13th to know that the most recent false flag involving a modified uh, airliner, modified with both an uninterruptible autopilot and an air tranquilizing injector, uh, the most recent one was March 24th. It was a Saturday, as I recall. And it occurred in the French Alps when three French Mirage jet fighters uh, appropriately shot down an unarmed civilian Airbus German Wings Flight 9525 because the trajectory of the Airbus was on a collision course with uh, Lake, I can't remember, uh, P-I-C-N-O-N, I think it's Lake Pinkham. It's the largest freshwater reservoir in Western Europe and had pre-placed explosives been there, 
like the pre-placed explosives that were in buildings one, two, and seven, uh, then what we would have seen is we would have seen the illusion, the suggestion, the noble lie that the Airbus being driven by an uninterruptible autopilot on flight plan two in the FMGC uh, would it would hit the dam right as somebody detonated the pre-placed explosives that would breach the dam. And so in one foul act, which was prevented by the French Air Force fighter pilots shooting down, it was the third fighter that shot down the Airbus. The first two were visual IDs. Um, and they would have uh, triggered the explosives. So everybody in the world that's dumb would think, holy buckets, an Airbus just blew down the dam. No, an Airbus, I don't care which Airbus, they don't have enough mass. In fact, David, I want you to talk about energy, mass uh, and velocity. And you tell me if you think any Airbus could create uh, a breach of an earthen dam that's holding back the biggest body of water in Western Europe. So uh, I put a little, I put a couple of Easter eggs in there for people like David Tochin of the NTSB who sent his wife, Mrs. David Tochin, out to uh, figure out who the guy was that made up the fake uh, Asiana 214 names. Uh, something Wan, We Too Low, Holy Foo, Bang Ding, Ow. And if anybody wants to see my email from me to the NTSB director, David Tochin, all you have to do is let me know you want to see it, and I will forward you the original copy. David, that's quite a mouthful. Did you pick up on the MSN 1114 and the Airbus and the 13th of July? Over to you. Uh, in relation to flying into the mountainside, over to you. Oh, no, uh, I was just laying something in the weeds. Uh, but I, I was asking you about the uh, total energy of an Airbus. Let's say the Airbus is going 400 miles an hour and the Airbus weighs uh, 155,000 pounds. Do you think that's enough energy to, to breach a dam that's huge? Uh, absolutely not. And just as it's uh, not enough energy in a Boeing running into the North or South Towers uh, to bring those down, it needs a little, I think they call it um, uh, accelerant is uh, the appropriate word. Over to you. Yes, and Jake R. Uh, is a male. I know that because he says that he pulled up November 878 Romeo Sierra. That's in the chat room. So let's see if a female pulled up 876 or 874 Romeo Sierra. Uh, because if no female daily double, uh, do, 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 one half mass velocity squared. Thank you, George H. George H. is our new musical director at Able Danger. Um, and because I want to see what the FAA uh, has on November 878 RCS, or excuse me, Romeo Sierra. Well, for this A3, was 144825, it was, oh, this is interesting. It's an NRA3B. Uh, let's see if it's still active. Do, 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 do. It says Raytheon owns it. These guys are done. Um, to expiration date, ah, it's expired. Well, raise my rent. Maybe, Maybe this was used on 9-11. Uh, I'm not sure. But uh, if somebody can Google NRA3B, November Romeo Alpha 3, the numeral 3, B, Bravo, uh, plus BUNO, B-U-N-O, that means Bureau number. Maybe it'd be better to put Bureau number, plus U.S. Navy, plus 144825. Um, there were two of these Raytheon owned uh, for the CIA. Um, they were modified at Fort Collins, Loveland, Colorado Airport, which just like Sandy Hook no longer exists. Uh, and uh, David, do you, think, do you think that you and I are working very hard to uncover all this stuff or is it coming fairly easy for us? Oh, it's easy. I know it's easy. You know, all I do is I sit around in the morning, I get a cup of coffee and I Google myself if I really want to move on. But um, the more, the more- Too much information. Oh, we, we've put out too much information. I mean, Christine Marcy plus Hillary Clinton, a person could write 10 books on those two names just on what we've written about those two people. 
And what's their connection? Their connection is Jesuits, Georgetown, and false flags. David, over to you. Okay, uh, paragraph one, today's post. Pinkerton has used timing signals from the GPS atomic clock, that's the global positioning system, atomic clock, to track hotel guests around the world since JFK's stay at the Hotel Texas in downtown Fort Worth on November the 22nd, 1963, the day before a lone gunman killed him in Dallas. And since up to 30 British citizens staying at a Tunis hotel were assassinated by another lone gunman on June the 26th, 2015. Now this lone gunman uh, in Tunis, uh, as I say, it's a sort of James Bondian uh, kind of maneuver, except that he's shooting up the good guys, just innocent holiday makers. But you know, he arrives on a jet ski or a Zodiac, and he's presumably got some pretty sophisticated communication system because he was actually filming the victims as he shot them. So I don't know if he had a gun uh, sight, uh, what do you call it, a telephoto lens or something on his uh, Kalashnikov or whatever it was. Oh, and his, he hid the Kalashnikov in a beach uh, parasol. I think I taught you parasol, didn't I, Field, over you? Yes, we were talking about parasol, uh, ladies' undergarments, and Hillary Clinton's, um, well, she's got 46 dead people. But she's, she's a lightweight compared to Obama. Obama's got 2,200 plus wrongful deaths in Afghanistan. So Hillary could go around killing people for the rest of her life, and she'd never, she'd never get to be anywhere close to uh, the abomination that Obama is to this nation. Uh, David, we've got the world's greatest chat room because I put out a couple of numbers. I've put out 144825 plus NRA3B. And a couple of interesting photos came up. One of them is of the aircraft itself. Uh, another one is from tail sign uh, November, uh, excuse me, Papa Romeo, which is not Puerto Rico. Uh, Jack Mac NA3B uh, radar test bed aircraft. Yes, Jack Mac. And there's something else interesting about NRA. And I'm not an expert on this, and so I'm reaching out to Jack Mac. I wish what's his name was here. Uh, jet Racer, let me see, NWA, do we have Jet Racer here today? No, do, 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 do. Nope, no Jet Racer. But uh, Swamp Rat uh, is a very good Googler too. I think, Jack Mac, uh, looking at the registration, or not the registration, the type of the aircraft, okay, initially it was an A3. Of course, the first A3 would be an A3A, so we knew that this aircraft was the second model, an A3B. Then in front of the R A is an R. That means reconnaissance. But the really interesting abbreviation is N. And here's where I might be wrong or I might be right. And certainly Jack Mac or Swamp Rat will be able to prove me right or wrong. If I'm not mistaken, N Nate's remote control. Uh, Jack Mac or Swamp Rat, can you confirm that or prove it to be false? Jake R., which uh, is a fellow in Kansas, north and west of Kansas City, uh, he might be able to figure it out too. Uh, there's, there was a C-135 that went down under mysterious circumstances and it left Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in about 1976 and it was an NC-135, because if I'm on the wrong track or if I'm snipping up the wrong um, number, but the NRA-3B, uh, what would make that aircraft very valuable is off the top of my head, I believe that particular aircraft is the only A-3 produced that has never landed on an aircraft carrier. What's the point? It would be a lot less stress than any other a3 Sky Warrior because landing on an aircraft aircraft, uh, and keep in mind the A3 was the biggest and heaviest aircraft to ever operate from an aircraft carrier, with of course the exception of 1963 when Lieutenant Commander Flatley, the F, uh, and if I had to guess the tail number, I'd say it ends with 798. Uh, whatever it is, I've flown that aircraft, and so watch how quickly. 
Jake R uh, KC-130F plus Carrier Landing plus Flatley, F-L-A-T-L-E-Y. And uh, he'll be able to get the bureau number, which might be 149798. But it, uh, I think it does end in 798. We're going to find out. Could be 797. Who knows? Well, actually, Google knows. The, N the NSA knows. The NRA knows. The DIA knows. And uh, the BFD may or may not know. Uh, anyway, Dave, it over to you while I sit here and try to do the same aircraft. Yes, and it is a radar test bed aircraft. And I'm almost confident that it's, uh, it's never landed on an aircraft carrier, which would make it if I were awarded an A3 for my part in helping David Hawkins unravel 9-11, I would want it to be this particular A3 because it's never been beat up on an aircraft carrier. David, over to you. Yeah, if it's radar targeted, those two uh, cable wheels that uh, Amy left outside straddling the window, uh, behind which Captain Gerald DeConto was trying to commission the U.S. Uh, Navy's uh, Pentagon Command Center, that would have helped the um, weapons platform uh, take him out almost with a shot between the eyes. It's kind of symbolic. Anyway, paragraph two. Pinkerton appears to have infiltrated cross-dressing agents, in brackets, steel v -doc, and I'll come to that in a minute, into circos, formerly RCAGB 1929, that is Radio Corporation of America, Great Britain, 1929, in the period, of course, when William Stevenson was actively betraying both countries, the United States and the United Kingdom, to the man who was at the telegraph post when the Titanic went down, or allegedly the Titanic went down. Let me reread that uh, paragraph, otherwise I'm sure I'll get the uh, listeners lost. Pinkerton appears to have infiltrated cross-dressing agents, steel the dock, into Circos, formerly RCAGB 1929 8A companies around the world, and allegedly used Circo GPS tagging systems to monitor the snuff film crews needed to record money shots for online assassination betting clocked through Circo's 8A onion router network, TOR. So in order to do online assassination betting and get away with it, there's a reasonable chance that uh, no one can eavesdrop your betting, you need to use the onion router network. And the onion router was invented at the US Navy's research labs around the 1996 period and caught the attention of a corrupt and treasonous patent lawyer by the name of Hillary Clinton, who realized that if the United States Navy was able to communicate without being eavesdropped, it would make her work immensely harder if she wanted to mobilize Field Sisters 8A companies and attempt the overthrow of the United States government on 911. So she could not permit the U.S. Navy to proceed with equipping capital ships around the world with the onion router and therefore insulate them against uh, eavesdropping by the 8A companies that Field System was working on. So she ordered someone, probably the Secretary of the Navy, either by blackmail or extortion, uh, that probably involved uh, some same-sex relationship somewhere in the world and uh, the use of children to make the blackmail that much more effective. And this is just a hypothesis. She ordered the Secretary of the Navy at the time to apply for a patent in 1998. And that patent was issued, I believe, in June or July of 2001 at about the time the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey sold a 99-year lease on the World Trade Center complex to a consortium that used a master servicer named Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo put up about $3.2 
dollars, I believe. And Larry Silverstein chipped in about uh, 20 million or some pocket change. So the de facto owner of the Twin Towers, or at least the 99 year lease on the Twin Towers, under a fraudulent leveraged lease arrangement, was Wells Fargo, which doubled the insurance on the Twin Towers. Interestingly enough, the broker that put the insurance contract on the Twin Towers together was an outfit by the name of Willis Faber. And Willis Faber was the insurance broker for the Titanic, which I think is interesting. It's also the broker for the four planes that went down associated with the Malaysian Airlines spot fixing gambling casino just a block or two away from where Phil McConnell was last year. Where was I last year? Well, you're in uh, Kuala Lumpur, right? Yes, and what did I tell Matthias Chang? You told him that if he didn't um, help you help him solve the disappearance of Flight 370, there would be another attack, and I think you were able to spot fix it. I did spot right? fix it. I said, uh, I'm trying to quote myself now and remind me, uh, Sunshine wanted me to send her the letter where I explained to NTSB that I was the source of those fake names, something Wong, We Too Low, Holy Fook, and bang, ding, ow. Uh, so I'll do that, but I don't want to get into email right now. Uh, but if anybody else wants to be copied to my email response to Sunshine with a letter that I sent uh, David Tochin of the TS MTSB, I will do that immediately after the radio show. If someone uh, calls me on my cell phone, this one right here, 715-307-8222. If anybody wants to see if that's really my cell phone number, 715-307-8222, they could dial it and they would hear a popcorn uh, ringtone because the other one that uh, Sunshine and Gloria put on my phone was really obnoxious. So I changed it to popcorn. And when my 21-year-old daughter gets here Friday night or my 23-year-old daughter gets here tonight, I'll have one of those young ladies um, change it to what it should be, which is, of course, Hawaii 5 -0. David, you know, uh, Jay Carr in Kansas had accused me of having a good memory. You know what? He might be right. Do you know why I'm saying this? Are you looking at the chat room? Uh, yes, I was. Uh, there's, uh, send me a copy field and the link to the newest ranch. Okay, that's from Taco. Taco, would you... Would you dial 715-307-8222 to trigger my uh, sound, whatever you call it, my ringtone? And I promise not to answer it and cost you a minute. So it'll cost you nothing to dial me 715-307-8222. And because he asked me for not only the MTSB, but uh, I'm writing it down, as you can clearly see, MTSB plus Second Ranch plus how do you like that David uh, well I don't think like is the appropriate word but it's um, certainly uh, attention getting it is it's and uh, so I'm not going to answer it because if I answered it, it might cost them three cents or something but I'm writing down NTSB second ranch and uh, let's see that goes to sunshine and Boy, he's a, he really hangs in there, doesn't he? Uh, sunshine and Taco. And if anybody hasn't, if you're not familiar with Taco, man, he's the guy that invented the taco rack, which I would hold up right now, but I took it to England and gave it away. Um, but uh, the thing I was telling you, David, about my memory I, I know fully well that the C-130, and you can see the picture of the C-130, It's uh, there's a picture of it taking off from the Forrestal. Uh, you know, keep in mind, this was in 1963, four years before John McCain trashed the Forrestal, or was involved in the trashing of the Forrestal. 
if you want to find that out, just put in July 1967 plus John McCain. A copy field. Oh, yeah, then I just got a missed call from Taco. I knew that. Um, David, uh, I'm going to stop now because I'm getting myself mentally confused, but I, I flew an aircraft out at El Toro in 1973 and 1974, and I know the tail number was 798, and I thought the first three digits were 149, and I thought that 798 was the aircraft that Lieutenant Commander flat, um, but why would I know all this stuff, and uh, why would I know who arranged this over some alcohol? Uh, Somebody named Admiral Flatley was at a bar drinking, and he said, my son's the best pilot in the Navy. He could land anything on an aircraft carrier, to which some, uh, some probably a Marine or a fighter pilot, same difference, said, oh, yeah, but he can't land a C-130 on an aircraft carrier, to which the uh, alcohol-induced four-star admiral said, of why Lieutenant Commander Flatley went out and landed a U.S. Marine Corps KC-130F, which I've flown, 149798, on a carrier four years before John McCain's A-4 lit up the flight deck of the forest fire. Um, and of all the people on the flight deck of the forest fire in July of 1967 that were alive on the morning of that fateful day, uh, I think around 167 of them may be dead by the evening, but only one person out of the whole crew complement of the USS Forrestal, which would have been about 5,000 men. And I think his daddy probably got his uh, limp ass off the aircraft carrier, fearing that maybe some rightful retribution would turn into a blanket party for Lump John. David, over to you. Uh, yeah, Phil. Well, um, I think I put up a few images and this one that I've just put up may not look particularly spectacular but it is the essence of uh, assassinations that go back to the time of Abraham Lincoln so whilst the technology is different just bear with me on the left hand side you got this profile of a guy in a uniform he's got a hat etc now if you look at that guy's uniform and compare that maybe someone because I'm not so dexterous with the images Google uh, Gaddafi's female guard and you'll put up an image of his female guards and you'll see that they were dressed in a very similar way to the uniform which just by the silhouette looks like is a male. And this is the essence of the high value target assassinations where the case goes cold. What they do and this is essentially the Serco and uh, Pinkerton agents, they groom cross-dressers. And of course, they recruit ones where cross-dressing comes naturally. And I imagine they recruited Barry Svitaro at a pretty early age, because after all, he was probably groomed in cross-dressing by his nanny, who was a male, uh, dressed up in female clothing, who allegedly used to amuse him by putting lipstick on herself. But my guess is that she put lipstick on little Barry when he was seven or eight years old and taught him how to be effeminate. Probably didn't come naturally, but anyway, that's by the by. Now, she was a hooker, so he used to go out at night, whether with the knowledge and consent of Barry's parents, I don't know, but you have to either assume uh, on their part, that is Lolo Svitaro, the stepfather, and Dan Dunham, the biological mother, the presumed uh, biological mother, you have to assume malice of forethought, or parents who should have had their child taken away from them at a very early age before he could do serious damage as he's presently doing to the United States Republic. Anyway, that's a bit of an aside, but if you go back to the uniform worn by Kate Warne, W-A-R-N-E, when Alan Pinkerton seconded her as a security guard to Abraham Lincoln, you can see that presumably Alan Pinkerton 
was relying on her, how shall I put it, female charms in masculine uniform to infiltrate the legitimate security of Abraham Lincoln so that whilst she allegedly got him into Washington without being um, swung from the lamppost in 1861, by 1865 she was in a position, and here it comes again, to stand down security on Abraham Lincoln when he was in the Ford Theatre such that he was readily accessible to a gun held by John Wilkes Booth, who could plug him and then run away, with enough uh, tracking and telemetry systems, back then it would have been the telegraph, to make sure that uh, John Wilkes Booth would be tracked down, and then shot by a guy, now whether he was a cross-dresser or not, I don't know, but he was, uh, how should I put it, a sexually challenged from an identity point of view because he cut his testicles off. That's the guy this from Boston. Is, yeah, Boston Corbin. Yeah. Yeah, what a nut. But, yeah, what a, well, a lack of nuts. But, um, well, well, wait a minute. Well, let me just play this out for some people because, you know, humor doesn't travel well. So for our friends over in England, I'm going to pretend like I'm Boston Corbin. Okay, watch this. Me and my... Oh, no! Did you hear it? Did you get my point, David? Well, which point are you talking about? Well, I've got a knife, and, uh, and I, I, I placed it down by my twig and berries, and uh, then I made a sawing motion, and then my voice, which is in the baritone range, as soon as the sawing motion had done the intended damage, my voice changed, as is evidenced by the fact that my Boston Corbett sound went from baritone to, oh, no! Get it? Yeah, I do get it, Phil. Now, I just put a picture up of Gaddafi. Now, does anyone in the chat room now know how Gaddafi died and if there is any similarity to the way Christopher Stevens died in Benghazi on 9-11-12? Over to you, Phil. Yes, um, Gaddafi, wasn't he also a sodomized? Uh, in fact, was it a knife that sodomized Gaddafi, David? Is a bayonet. Well, that's a knife, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, that's good, I'm checking my memory. Somebody just put up a, a picture, <laughs> your dog just barked, probably because the uh, taco man just put up a picture of Michael. Where's that? Uh, yes, and so let me write on my list. I'll make sure that I highlight Michael Huerta in this letter that I'm going to post as soon as our radio show is over. I'm going to post this letter to Sunshine Taco, and they will see, also receiving the letter will be David Tochin and Michael Huerta and the Milwaukee FBI and Suzanne Lynn Kalfas, the Alpha attorney, who is the lead attorney in ensuring that Judge Rosemary M. Collier did not have the information that the judge needed to prevent uh, 13, that's hence the Baker's dozen, 13 false flag airliner crashes uh, since the day I put them on notice. And watch this for critical recall, David. At 2159:10 on the 10th of December of 2006, I let Alpa, FBI, and FAA know about the illegal modifications. David, over to you. Yes, yeah, so I popped in a picture of Gaddafi being sodomized with what I think is a bayonet. And this is consistent, I believe, with the value system of radical cross-dressing pedophiles. Uh, where sodomy is, to them, an art form. Not that those organs or orifices are designed to receive it, but they've adjusted their value system in order to exploit it. So when they have a target, a high-value target, where uh, they need the money shot, now I'm not sure whether this bayonet killed him, it certainly didn't do him the, much good, but I imagine, well, the evidence is before us, there was someone taking shots or filming 
the murder, the torture murder of Muammar Gaddafi, who may or may not have been a particularly nice guy. Um, whether he was nicer than Christopher Stevens, I don't know, but maybe someone could put up an image of Christopher Stevens, either just having been sodomized with a cattle prod, courtesy of Hillary Clinton. So it's kind of sobering when you think that any security guard that is deployed to protect a high-value target in the United States of America could potentially be infiltrated if counterintelligence in that country had been dismantled, as apparently it was when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in the Ford Theatre and Gaddafi was assassinated in the desert somewhere, or Christopher Stevens was assassinated in a Benghazi hotel after having been abducted from the United States mission and the CIA subcontractors, former SEALs, Tyrone Powers was one, and what was the other name? Um, what, what, man, Tyrone Powers is gay actor. What are you talking about? Uh, there were two former SEALs in Benghazi that died. What were their names? Tyrone Woods and Glenn Doherty. Don't, don't confuse Tyrone Woods with Tyrone Power. Tyrone Power is square in the $3 bill. Tyrone Woods, um, well, let me, Tyrone Wood or Woods? Tyrone Wood, I think singular. Uh, Swamp Rat or Jack Mac will fix that right up. David, I've got quite a list going because um, a lady in England has joined a lady in Montana and a gentleman in New York for wanting letters of my MTSB. Uh, and so I'll be sending that as soon as we get done with the radio show. And I'll still be in chat to make sure it gets... Uh, received by all parties that want it. Um, Tyrone Wood, or is it Woods? Well, let's find out. We got the best chat room in the world. Um, do you need more taco rack samples? Uh, no, I really don't taco, but I'll tell you, what, next time I go on a trip to England, I might uh, buy some from you and take over there because people really like getting those as um, gifts, you know, and I, I just, if I pay for them or if you send them free, I still give them away and I don't mind paying for them. Um, and I wish I didn't have to go down to get that hearse. But I don't think uh, Freeport Girls here, I'll give it back to you in just a minute, David. I want our chat room to tell me if Tyrone Woods um, is, or Tyrone Wood, which is, I don't like to hammer somebody's... Um, surname when they're heroic and they give their life to what they thought was their country which of course they didn't give their life for their country tyrone wood and glenn doherty gave up their life because bill clinton's beard named hillary operation pig balls clinton hillary and obama and my sister christine marcy um caused the wrongful death of Tyrone Wood, uh, Stevens, Glenn Doherty, and the fourth party who's under, I can picture the mother, her first name's Pat, and I can't remember her son, but the fourth guy that was killed, his mother has objected and she's exposed the evil trio that I just uh, mentioned. Christine Marcy, Hillary Clinton, and Barry Spatero, Puno 79. So, uh, Tyrone Woods. Thank you, Taco Man. He just put up a picture of Tyrone, and it is indeed plural Woods. Uh, his real name, given name, Tyrone Snowden Woods, January 15th, 71, to September 12th, 2012, of Imperial Beach, was born in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and we happen to have a danger up in Portland, Oregon right now. So, David, you go ahead and do smart stuff while I keep the chat room happy. Okay. White's Club members, including alumnus David Cameron, Tom Tagger Stacy. Uh, Tom Stacy founded the Tag Defenders Association in 1983 before introducing it into British Columbia and Boulder, Colorado. 
and Serco CEO Rupert Soames, with access to Pinkerton GPS timing signals and Serco's 8A agents, allegedly spot fixed the body count for up to 30 British victims of the Tunis online assassination betters after the lone gunman was shot after he reached the spot. So the allegation would be, Field, that this lone gunman, uh, and incidentally he was trained in Libya, thanks Hillary, he was trained in Libya, allegedly at some Islamist ranch somewhere, but quite obviously the level of sophistication of training that he got is much more closely associated with Serco's 8A companies than some ragtag brigade that is into anal sodomization with a bayonet. So the only way in which you could track this guy is if you had access to the United States Defense Red Switch Network and the onion router clock. Remember, the onion router is essentially a technology developed by the U.S. Navy to prevent eavesdropping. So if you want to send up, set up a spot fixing or online assassination betting opportunity, you don't want a whole bunch of people interfering with you. So you train the guy in Libya, you equip him with a weapon and a cell phone that can take images of the money shots. Um, it wouldn't be surprised if it was attached to his, uh, his gun so that you could actually see the faces of the people as they were shot because you need that degree of precision. All of these frames have to be time-stamped and then backhauled to the BBC in London. So the betters can or recognize which of the betters was closest in predicting the time of death of the victim. So my guess is they, uh, they had decided that they wanted 30 British victims to die, or maybe 28, or maybe 27. So the guys brought in after the security at the hotels, and I think there was a, an attack on a Tunis uh, museum a few months back, which would have meant, had the Tunis security system been operational correctly, a lot of armed guards in the vicinity of hotels frequented by high-value targets like British tourists. And remember, we're talking about humiliating the British or humiliating the Americans or humiliating the Canadians or humiliating the Australians or humiliating the New Zealanders because these are the founder members of the Five Eyes countries, which up to the arrival of the Clintons in the White House in 1993 was the premier anglophone counterintelligence and surveillance system in the world obviously a target for infiltration. So the way the online assassination betting would have worked would have been the people who are into that kind of thing, which are members and alumni of White's Club, <coughs> who were doing something similar in the 18th century in their own club, but there were too many riots breaking out. So in the 19th century, they had the bright idea of exporting the bookmaker from within the club to outside, so they selected um, Ladbrokes. And incidentally, Ladbrokes, did you know Ladbrokes owned the Langham Hotel field over you? Honestly, no. But Ladbrokes, that gives me a bad taste in my mouth. And I know you can't see me because you don't have live stream uh, camera playing, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you guys something that gives a good taste in my mouth. It's on the tip of my tongue. Here it comes. Ready? And what that is, it's a delightful Cavendish and Harvey mixed fruit drop. And as you can see, this tin of mixed fruit drops, they're such desirable fruit drops that they actually have a gold label and they're, they're immersed in a sea of powdered sugar. Let me prove it. You might think this is cocaine. Oh, powdered sugar. Okay, David, over to you for some intelligent stuff while I put up a Google search for Pat Tillman. Okay, so the way it would have worked is that the Ladbrokes betters, where Ladbrokes plays the role of the bookmaker for online assassination betting, 
and incidentally has an office in Kuala Lumpur, a kitty corner from where Field uh, was staying in his hotel. Uh, and obviously that's where they were, the call centre was handling bets on MH370 and MH, uh, MH17. Uh, so Ladbrokes would open the book or the playbook for the attack in Tunis and the betters with White's Club or associated with White's Club, some combination of David Cameron, Tom the Tagger Stacy and Rupert Soames, the CEO of Soko, <coughs> would put their own money or other people's money against the high value target name or names and the predicted time of death for each of the target and then they might have had a rounding up uh, approach where they predicted the body count. So let's say hypothetically they predicted 29 bricks killed in this attack and the they predicted or bet on the time of each of the victims death. So then they bring in through the Pinkerton GPS personal okay, well, tracking I'm system the circuit tags they bring this guy in on a jet ski or a Zodiac into uh, Tunis, I think at a resort near Sous, S-O-U-S-S-E. They stand down the security, the Pinkerton security in the hotel. Do I know where the Pinkerton was flying security to the hotel? No, I don't have a clue. Do I know where the Pinkerton was providing security to the killer? No. All I do know is that in order for this guy to reach his target, the basic security of the hotel has to be stood down and the intelligence being fed to the killer has to be stood up. He has to know more about where his victims are than the people deployed or employed to defend them. How do you achieve a stand down of security for your guy and a stand-up of security for the enemy's guy. Well, cross-dressing is a brilliant technique because if the public is expecting to see a man providing security and see a woman providing insecurity, then maybe the woman can say, hey, the coast is clear, there's no guards around, I've got a weapon in case anyone does create an obstacle to the online spot fixed uh, betting and that message is sent to the guy on the jet ski or the Zodiac. So he's given coordinates as to where he docks his uh, ship and uh, where he goes to start shooting. He's apparently full of cocaine so he's drugged up like that guy who's allegedly cut loose in the Southern Carolina church, except I think that guy had um, oxazone, which is a drug that helps people get off opioids, and in and of itself it's more addictive than the opioid individuals. You can rely on them, presumably, carrying out whatever illusion is passing through their brain, which might take a bit of time to inject into their brain. Well, uh, Christine Marcy actually launched a prisoner medical program when she was at the Department of Justice. So I think Phil told me that you, she is a failed doctor, that she didn't pass her doctor's examination. So she went, became a bureaucrat and a psychopath, but I, I digress. So this guy, doped up on cocaine, arrives on his jet ski or his Zodiac with his GPS system with instructions where to start killing. He's got his AK-47 or whatever it is, Kalashnikov, inside a filled up parasol. He arrives at the hotel, maybe someone could put that map, at a place where the cross-dressing security has stood down or sent away the people who might shoot this bastard before he starts shooting Brits, and he's ready to start killing. He's got a camera, maybe attached to his gun, his rifle, 
so you can catch the expression on a victim's face just before they die, and then the image of what happens to the body when the bullets go into it, and a time-stamped image that is back called to the BBC in London. The BBC then transmits those backhauled images to Ladbrokes, which shows the online assassination better as the precise time the victim has died. And over on the right-hand side of the screen, for all I know, is number of victims. So that starts to go up. With the first victim, it's one. Presumably, the shots have to be fired sufficiently close to the individual's head so that there's no argument about whether he's dead. A bit like Pat Tillman, which I think was a short burst of three bullets in the middle of his forehead, which is a fairly, I imagine, an ambiguous statement that the guy's dead because the back of his head has been blown off. According to his mother, who told me that over the phone. Right. And, of course, um, with victims like that, uh, sooner or later they're going to end up in a body bag. And you know what, Phil? I would guess that the body bags numbered 1 through 30 or 1 through 28 had already been set aside to receive the bodies of the victims before they're flown back to the United Kingdom for cremation and burial. Remember, of course, we want to make sure, or they want to make sure, that there's no forensic autopsy done on the body parts to indicate, um, let's say, if there's a bullet there, what the provenance of the, the bullet was. Now, why does that matter? Well, because uh, Seco, in the wisdom of the United States government under Barry Sutoro, has outsourced the operation of the Defence Ammunition Centre to the British company Serco. So Serco, through GPS and so on, tracks every round of ammunition that flows through the American military and civilian uh, communities. Kind of neat if you want to structure a crime scene so that people are pointed in the wrong direction. So the guy starts killing. The betters with the bookmaker count up the number of dead. And they're betting on the time of killing for each victim. So that's the 30 or 25 spot-fixing opportunities to bet on. A lot of fun for the <coughs> creatures in the United Kingdom associated with White Club. And over on the right-hand corner is the body count, and they're betting on the body count, let's say a spread between 25 and 30. Unbeknown to the betters, the bookmaker then does a deal with the cross-dressing security in Tunis, and as the guy gets to, let's say, 27, and there's a huge amount of money on 27 dead, uh, owned by one of the insiders of David Cameron, Tom Stacy, or Rupert Soames, then they shoot him before he gets to the 28th victim. So they can actually deliver a predetermined number of dead by whacking the guy when he goes or reaches that point. It's a bit like kicking a soccer ball into the touch at a particular time. So immediately David Cameron jumps in and says, uh, England will not, the Britain will not bow to this Islamist menace and will take every action to prevent it happening again. Well, this, chin, this chinless wonder, of course, has done nothing to stop these kind of incidents happening since he got anywhere near the United Kingdom government. And what was the period which was particular relevance where he started his attack on the United States, then on the United Kingdom government. Well, it was 1990 to 1993, when he was advisor to the former Rothschild banker, Norman Lamont, who was chancellor in the period of Black Wednesday, when the UK had a treasury to pull out of the European exchange rate mechanism. And someone, and it has to be David Cameron, leaked that intelligence to George Soros, who took a short position 
in the pound because he knew that he was going to pull out of uh, the exchange rate mechanism. And he made a million pounds profit, which apparently he used to finance various uh, Pinkerton cross-dressing agents, including little Barry Spitaro. So it's 12.35, Field. We covered a lot of ground. Um, what would you like to do now? I'd like to ask you a question because the big red button just came up. Do you have any idea yeah. where I promised to have the uh, Able Danger Hearst stop for a photo opportunity next week when I'm on my way back from Canton, Georgia? No. Well, uh, if you go back later, like after you go out and get some fresh air and have a half of a beer, no more than seven ounces, um, 